Hello, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. My name is Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Good, good afternoon on this rainy Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, welcome to the show wherever you're watching. So happy that you're going to spend the next hour with us. And today we are really, really pleased to welcome to the show Dr. Frank Smith Jr. He is the president of the African American Civil War Museum. That's right here in DC, which was established in, in de or dedicated in 1998. <clears throat> He's a former member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, otherwise known as SNCC, S -N -C -C, um, where he joined in Mississippi. He is a former DC council member for Ward 1. Um, he was also a participant to the March on Washington, D.C., which I'm definitely looking forward to talking with him about. And he was also jailed for his work around voter registration activism, um, something else we'll be spending some time talking about today. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much. Good to be with you. I'm so pleased to have, have you with us. Yes, we're excited. I know I'm excited because I think you actually... Um worked with my uncle. My uncle was Joseph Yaledale. Of course. Yep, so you worked with him. So it's just going to be an honor to talk to you about all of that. Okay. So I'd kind of like to start with them um, with the museum because I get I really get the sense that the African American Civil War Museum was was really like um was your baby. Um was really something that you were very very passionate about. And I just would like to spend just a little bit of time talking about how that came to be. And more importantly, how did you get the funding to do it? Okay. Well, let me say uh, a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, I want to say to all the young people, remember how this gets started. Back in 1962, I was in Mississippi as a civil rights worker. I, I, I'm working with a group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And they've decided they want people to leave school for a year or two, leave college and go up to Mississippi, become full-time organizers. Uh, and, I, and I get over there to Holly Springs. I meet a man named Henry Reeves. Mr. Reeves has his grandfather's rifle and he has his grandfather's uniform. His grandfather served in the Civil War. I never heard this story before in my life. <clears throat> I was a three year, I'd been at Morehouse for three years by then in Atlanta to college, pretty good school, you know? And when Dr. King went to school and others, and I've been involved in the civil rights movement there, I was majoring in political science. But I never heard anything about black soldiers in the Civil War until this man showed me his rifle and his uniform. I got interested in it then. Now, now I knew when I went over there that this was a place where African Americans kind of right during Reconstruction had served as mayor and they served as sheriff of this county. And the place was 76% black, yet there were no black people registered to vote. That's why SNCC sent me over there to try to register some people to vote. And Mr. Reeves sought me out because he was working in the next county but he heard I was working here and he said, well, here's a guy that might be able to help me. So he came as others did because they heard there was, at that time they called all of us freedom riders. <laughs> they heard that there was some freedom riders in, over in Holly Springs who were willing to work with them. So Mr. Reed, uh, I saw his rifle in his uniform. I got introduced, I started reading about them. I took a class at Russ College in Negro History. They had a book uh, that was written by John Hope Franklin uh, that, was, uh, that had a chapter in there about these black soldiers. It was fascinating reading for me. And here I was in a place where black people have been able to, to register and vote in the 1860s and 1870s, running for office, serving mayor, sheriff. And so we won these rights and lost them, had to win them all over again. So there are two stories here. One is that uh, Mr. Reeves had saved his rifle and he gave he showed it to me as sort of a teaser. And I got interested in it. And that's how I got uh, started working on this story. Years later, when I get to be a council member here in DC, when it's my job to help rebuild U Street after the riots in 1968. Uh, we got to think of some we can do here. So we covered this idea of building a monument. Uh, and, and since I was a Ward 1 council member then, and whatever I built, I had to raise the money for it. I said, well, if, we're gonna, we're gonna, if I got to raise the money, we're going to build what I want to build. <laughs> what I want to build is a, is a monument to these African American soldiers who gave their lives during the time of the Civil War, fight for their freedom, and never got any kind of recognition for it. I didn't even know about it myself until Mr. Reeves told me about him there in Mississippi. So came to this idea of building this monument. We went to the National Archives, got all these names, 209,145 names. Wow. All the American soldiers, put them up on these plaques outside and then built the monument. And as they say, the rest of it is history. But I want to thank Mr. Henry Reeves for bringing this to my attention back in 1962. When wow. I, I, I did not know that it was 209,000 soldiers. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. 
that is a lot of soldiers. Yep. And I guess for people viewing, you know, viewing this on their device in their home, you know, we often visit museums, but, and I'm guilty of this as anyone else, we don't really think about how the artifacts actually get into the museum. And you have thousands upon thousands of artifacts in the museum and, and kind of where were they coming from? Did, did people just donate them? Well, you know, I was on a show during Black History Month, uh, <clears throat> an organization that, that, that the phrases uh, arts and artifact uh, called me up and asked me if I would do a show for them for Black History Month. And, and uh, you know, I'm one of those guys, I, I, I specialize in something called the Civil War. If I can't do what you want me to do, I just tell you up front, I, I've never done that before. I'm not the art collector, I'm not the fine arts collector. They say, yeah, but you built the museum, so you must have had some role in figuring out which, that, which things you were gonna buy, and then you know what you were gonna keep, what you weren't gonna keep, where you were gonna put it. And as I thought about it, I got more interested in it. Because actually we're building, you know, our museum is expanding now. We just bought a building, we we're tripling the size of our building. We would have been finished by now, but COVID stopped us in our tracks. And so we yeah. got to work our way through this and get our shots and wait on the things to open back up. But um, we're doing an exhibit now called From Slavery to the White House, the story of First Lady Michelle Obama, who is a descendant of a Civil War soldier on her father's side and on her mother's side. Oh. And so uh, we're now collecting items for that exhibit. And uh, we just bought two things recently that I want to tell you about. Uh, actually, two of both of them we bought off, offline. We, we, one of them is a basketball. <coughs> that First Lady Michelle Obama and President Obama signed. And they played ball with it on, you know, he played, he'd get up early in the morning, invite somebody. He, he invited luminaries to come and play ball with him. You all might've been in that category. I'm, I'm just a PR, so I was never invited, but I knew- Not me, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> you had these guys like P. Diddy and, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the actors that would come up there and they play basketball on, on the, they have a goal up in the White House. And, so one of those balls that he played with and that, uh, that Mrs. Obama played with, we bought offline. Uh, we saw it for sale and my, my staff person working with me has got an alert on her phone now. When items come up, uh, certain items come up uh, that relate to the Civil War, her, alert, her alarm goes off. Oh, and wow, okay. Then she called me and said, should we get this or not? And you know, I've got to say, where would it fit, blah, blah, blah. And then also, what does it cost? Because <laughs> these things can be terribly expensive. But we bought this because we wanted something that, that had his, they, we knew they had put their hands on and touched, want to put it in, in the exhibit. So we bought that and we bought another item. We just acquired this uh, last week. We just acquired a copy of her high school yearbook. Uh, so now we have her high school yearbook from Whitney, Whitney Young High School in Chicago, where she finished school. And we have a, a college yearbook from Princeton University. So, so we have several items like that, that, uh, we, we, and that we, we acquired uh, these items online. Now, the bulk of our collection, however, we have obtained from family members uh, who have been working with us. Uh, uh, we, we got this story because one of the family members who was, this young lady whose name was Avia Barnes, who is Michelle Obama's first cousin. They are two, I missed it, they may be second cousins because their grandmothers were sisters. And so she and, she and Michelle were raised up together. And she's working with us on this exhibit. But she came to us uh, in 2009 after President Obama was elected president. Came to Washington for the inauguration. And her uncle had told her, he, was, he said, I'm 90 years old. I'm not going to Washington. It's too cold. You know, he lived in Michigan. I don't know why he thought it'd be cold here. It was Michigan, but he said he wasn't coming. So he told, but he told Audrey Barnes, he said, when you get to Washington, you go to the African American Civil War Museum. After you get through dining at all those fancy balls with your ball dress on and all that. You go to that museum because they have these names and they have the name of your great great grandfather up there. And I want you to go make sure it's there, it's proper and all that. So she showed up on the ninth of, uh, on, um, in 2009 at our museum with 13 family members said they were descendants of a soldier and they were, they were related to Michelle Obama. So they brought the story to us. And, and this, I, wanted, I want the audience to know this that in many cases, the best art, especially historical art for black people is in family collections. Yes. Family own these things. You, you all have them and you have to take care of them and make sure that they, so, so we, we buy a lot of stuff. And let me, let me just, do, I want to point something else to you out on the, while I'm thinking about this. I was looking at this while I was waiting on you guys to get, get me on the air. This is a photograph. You're not going to see this very well, but I'm going to show you this. This is a photograph. This is my great, this is my grandfather, Will Smith. 
My grand, my daddy, my daddy was a black sheep of the family. His daddy was a preacher. Okay, I'm Frank Jr. This is this is Will Smith, who's his father. My father, this is a this is his family. There are uh, nine, eight or nine members of his family. He's not on here because my father wasn't born yet. My grandfather paid a lot of money to get a photographer to come to his house, line his family up. They put on their best clothes, their Sunday go to meeting clothes, and they stood out in front of the house and made this photograph. Now, what is significant about this photograph? One is that my grandfather, and these are his, my, 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 my uncles and aunts here. Uh, but the other thing that's significant about it is that this took place in, 2000, in 1909. 1909. In 18, I mean, I'm sorry, 1903. 1903 was when this photograph was made. And you see all the names. When you, when you family members, when you collect these things, make sure somebody put these names down at the bottom. So, because I'll tell you right now, as we start to get old, we won't remember any of these names. <laughs> <laughs> some of these people were dead before I was born. So, thank God somebody wrote these names down so we can know who they all are. And uh, but but um, but this was 1903. Now, what is significant about this program? In 1898, there was a horrible lynching in Carrier County. This man was lynched on a Sunday afternoon. This is a Sunday. We're here at, at now talking about this on Sunday afternoon. At 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon in Newland, Georgia, we're just 30 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia now, where I was born. They, they lynched this man out in front of, of they, they, they catch him uh, on a Friday. He's in jail. Uh, the mob goes to the jail. The sheriff let the mob take him out of the jail. They take him out and they lynched this man in 1898. In 1903, this is when this photograph was made, four years later, right? My granddad was a preacher. He was a circuit riding Baptist preacher. He preached all over the county. Mm -hmm. My granddad would have been a grown man. You see how grown these kids are? All these children would have been grown. So my grandfather would have witnessed this, this murder. Now, why, why am I telling you this? Because one day, several years later, in June of 1962, I've been in Mississippi now for a while as a civil rights worker. I get, I get out of jail in Greenwood, Mississippi, because I've been arrested for trying to register people to vote. And I go home because my mother told me when I called her to tell her I was okay that they had killed me while I was in jail. She <laughs> told me that I had, been, I, I had been drafted to go to Vietnam. The Vietnam War was going on, and I had a draft notice waiting for me. I was late for the draft. I was AWOL already. So here I am being drafted to go to Vietnam to fight for somebody else's freedom. I don't have any freedom of my own. My people can't even register and vote over here in the United States of America. Mm. So, so, so I, I don't feel very good about this, but I have to go back because I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go to jail for the rest of my life for, for the day in the draft. And, uh, but when I got back to Georgia, I was, I was talking to one of my aunts about this. And my aunts told me, she said, well, I know you feel pretty good about yourself. She said, but you were not the first civil rights worker in County County. She said, the first civil rights worker in your family was this man right here, Will Smith. That was the first civil rights work. And still of that, that lynching and that mob scaring him and making him a coward and run away, he became more bold. And he became a, he became the leading civil rights worker in Coyote County. She said, you just following his footsteps. You're not the first one. I was feeling pretty good until she told me that. I said, okay, well, I guess I got something here. But that's a nice story because every one of us have a story like that in our families. Yes, we every, do. Every, every one of us has a photograph somewhere around here like this that you that you can find. Label it. Put put put. Write the names on there to make sure you get everybody's name right and and get their ages if you can. So that'll help some too. But there's a story out there somewhere, and you need to get it out there and get it out so your family can have these stories. They they will embolden you, make you want to do something. Uh, when I heard about this, that just made me a little bit ready, more ready to go. And so well, that was the reason why we wanted you on the show to share your stories, to share your um your adventures as far as you know, working into stuff like that to start to embolden people and get them to the point where they need to recognize and realize that their strength and what's going on today is much needed. And, you know, the movements that need to be done is much needed by not just our young, our younger um, people, but also people like my age, because I ain't as young as I look. <laughs> but you know just we need to really start being a part of it and I think that if we stop focusing on the same people 
every year because you know black history month is always focused on the same people martin luther king malcolm x harriet tubman sojourner truth you know you might throw in a different person every now and then but overall it's always the same people this is why our show this month was really dedicated to the folks that made people like martin luther king malcolm x and so on so um recognizable and known because of the work that you guys did in the background and you were definitely a background worker for all of that stuff and we want our show to know the people our audience to know and understand that these things just didn't happen all that stuff you know it it there was people that worked to make those things happen so um i'm gonna say it seems to be a common theme over this month that a lot of people were drawing strength from their family and their community. And that really played, it seems to have played a really important role and into the lead up into the 1960s civil rights movement. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And also, let me also mention one other thing about that that I think is important. And that is that, uh, that you know, we, as you said, uh, uh, Donnie, we were young people. I was a college student when I started this. I was. I left, I went, I went to college at 16. I was, so I was, I was, I, was, I didn't even turn 17 until I was halfway in my senior, my freshman year at Morehouse College. So, so I, so I was a young person, but I had heard the story about uh, Emmett Till being lynched in Mississippi. And I was, it takes me back to this lynching thing again. And it was one of the things that made me want to do something. And, and you saw that happen with Floyd here in the, in the United States. There was something about that murder about that eight minute that that police officer spent with his knee on the neck of this man while he's begging for his life. That went all around the world. Mm -hmm. People looked at this and said, this has gone too far. These black, black lives have to matter to somebody. Uh, if they don't, these people are never gonna stop this. That's and so right. I think that, was, that enabled us to, to put a movement together here that has made a big difference in the last uh, several years. And I, and I think that I wanna give Young people, a lot of shout outs for that. The, the, the people who are marching and picketing and, and then demonstrating now. And um, as long as you keep those things nonviolent, you will have a lot of support here in the United States. You'll have a lot of support from old people like me, and you'll have a lot of support from young people, and you have support across the aisle from whites, well meaning whites, and well meaning Hispanics, and, and, and others who will join you in your effort. And that's how we were able to put together enough of a coalition to, to, to beat back these trumpets who invaded the Capitol and get a, a Democrat elected president of the United States, which makes us feel, you think about what we would have been feeling like for Black History Month if Donald Trump had won a second term and he'd been in charge of the white, that mob that he had up there uh, at the Capitol on January 6th was in charge of this country. Uh, we, we'd be, we'd, we'd all be, uh, we, we, we wouldn't stop marching and wouldn't stop demonstrating. But I tell you what, we'd be in a lot more hostile situation than we are in right now, that's for sure. But before we get into your activism, because to be honest, that, that's going to be the, the whole rest of the show, because <clears throat> it, it's fascinating. What you did, the people that you were with, and what you achieved is, is just fascinating. I saw a video clip of you earlier today that I think you were doing um, an address from the museum. You said something that made my mouth drop open, and I told Donnie about this earlier, and it just kind of stopped her in her tracks. So you were putting kind of the, the bedrock of this whole conversation into context, at least for me. You were talking about slavery and you made the comment that slavery was never going to end without there being a war. And then you went on to say that collectively enslaved human beings in this country were worth billions, with a B, not with, not with an M, with the B, that what they produced over all those generations was worth billions. But this is the thing that stopped me in my tracks. You were talking about how some economists actually said that slavery contributed 72% to the gross domestic product. Right. That, that just floored me. Absolutely, yeah. yeah absolutely. And then, the yeah. thing that it got me from it was the fact that, you know, when, I, when Brian and I was talking about it, and I was like, well, yeah, that, that makes sense because that's why enslaved enslavers received reparation so yeah. i just wanted to put that out there now you go <laughs> because they received reparations and we still have not with that being said you go ahead <laughs> <laughs> well 
Okay, well, let me say something about reparations because it does tie in with that comment. Uh, first of all, slavery has been around forever. And slavery is in the Bible, it's in all of our literature. Uh, some people say it's still being practiced today in some countries. Uh, and slavery in antiquity had certain features to it. Uh, for example, you could enslave a person because they committed a crime. You can enslave a person because they, they did something wrong. Uh, a family member, a father could sell his son into slavery. If, if, his, if he owed somebody a debt, he could say, you could take my son for a period of time and this time my son will work their debt off. But slavery, it always had a term limit, never lasted long in seven years. And, the, uh, and, and at the end of the enslaved period of enslavement, that person who was enslaved had to be given uh, some land and some money so they could make a living. They could fit back into society when they regained all of their rights. That was a feature of slavery that existed until uh, the United States started the system that we had over here, where, where a person was enslaved for the rest of their life and a, and a child followed the condition of the mother, so babies were born enslaved. That system never existed before until they created that kind of system here in the United States. But most of all, let me just say that when, when slavery entered the United States with the 13th Amendment, the passage of the Emancipation Proclamation, there was some attempt to do uh, some kind of reparation. You know, everybody knows about 40 acres on the mule. That was, the concept there was they were to break up these plantations, give people 40 acres and a mule so they could get out and get started. They had to have a way to make a living, to earn a living for themselves and for their families. Now that got beaten back. You think about it for a minute. They said, well, yeah, after a while, somebody said, well, you know, you got all these white people living in the city. They don't own any land. We didn't promise them. We had all these immigrants who came here from Europe from Ireland and Germany and other places to fight in the Civil War, help make them win this war. They don't own anything. We can't give these black people property. White people don't own anything. So but there, there goes our reparations right there. <laughs> so, and the country never got around to this before. Uh, but let me, let me say one of, the, one of the interesting thing about this. I said you could regain all of your citizenship rights at the end of your slavery in, in antiquity. And especially in, uh, but in the, in the Greek, in the Roman and Greek societies, you could regain all your citizenship rights except for one thing. You could not be in the military. You could not put on a union, you could not put on a uniform. Wow. If they could reach the point where in order for him to win this war, he had to arm the slaves. He had to put them in uniform, put them out on these battlefields. He had to, he had to, in effect with the Emancipation Proclamation, he, he starts a, he, he starts an armed slave rebellion uh, to help them defeat the Confederacy so to keep the United States united under one flag. They owed us more than just 40 acres on the mule. They took out, they never gave us that, but they owed us more than just 40 acres on the mule. And so this is a battle that we have to keep fighting. I want to tell our young people now who are still trying to fight this battle, we've got to find a way to fashion this so the United States can help us get out of this rut that we're in now. We are, we are never going to catch up. We're doing better than any black people probably anywhere else in the world but we're never going to catch up with white people in the United States unless they give us back some of the money they stole from us during our period of enslavement, which went on for 250 years. So it's a fight that we're going to continue to try to fight here in the United States. We'll find a way to make this something that's reality. Uh, it will make us stronger. It will make America stronger, too. And they owe it to us. Um, well, that leads to another question that I actually have for you, but I wanted to kind of piggyback off of something that you said as far as, you know, putting people, getting people arrested, slavery and things like that. Frederick Douglass wrote during July um, 4th, well, actually it was written July 5th, 1852. And he actually stated, there are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death. White only, two, while only two of the same crimes will subject white man, would, would subject a white man to the like punishment. So out of those 72 crimes, only two of those crimes will allow white men to be punished by death or whatever the case may be. And then to me, what you said reminded me of that statement as far as arrest, getting them arrested, moving, you know, making them be slaves and all of that stuff. So that kind of, I just wanted to, to share that particular thing. But I also wanted to say to you, um, you, you worked 
in the civil rights during the civil rights movements when you were younger like you said you were 16 years old or whatever and like brian was saying everything that the theme for black history month seemed to push around um families helping families or people helping people right. so you right. had help then are you giving help to those um for black lives matter are they accepting the help because we're so much more well today's Fighters. Today's protesters are so much more violent than you guys were. And, and they tend to move in a direction where they say these things like, I'm not my ancestor, when no one is as strong as you guys were. They could never be as strong as y'all. So how, how do you help them understand and work forward the way that they need to work forward? Well, first of all, I think that the uh... Well, let me say the violence was around when we were demonstrating also. Uh, right. I remember the last time I saw Dr. Martin Luther King, I saw him the day before he was assassinated in Memphis. I had moved to Washington that year, 1968, in January. Remember, he got killed, I think, in April of 1968. So I've been there for four months. And uh, it was pretty scary. But I, but I happened to be traveling back to Mississippi for, for something I was doing there. And uh, we passed each other at the airport in Memphis. Uh, and he, I didn't think he knew who I was. I hadn't seen him since my days in Atlanta, just a rights worker, and he'd won a Nobel Prize since then and become very famous. And, and uh, he had, uh, but, he, but he called my name and asked me to come over across the aisle and talk to him. Call me Smith. He didn't remember my first name, but he remembered my last name. Well, Andy Young was with him, and I'm sure Andy told him who I was. So, so he said, and he, and he said to me, he said, Smith, I want you to come to Memphis and help organize these young people. He called them Panthers, too, by the way. He said, these young Panthers are throwing rocks at the police. And he said, I'm afraid they're going to provoke so much violence that these cops are going to start killing us, you know? And so, so, so there was violence around the edges of the movement then. But uh, even with, with Dr. King, who was so committed to nonviolence. Uh, but, uh, but because we were younger, he thought we were young enough so we could talk to these people. And he, he knew he was, he was 10 years older than I was, 12, 10 or 12. So he, he figured, OK, you're still young enough. You can communicate with these people. And I told him, I remember I told him this. I told him, I said, I'm getting, I moved to Washington, D.C. My wife and I are up there now. She's going to go to medical school. And I don't, I don't do that anymore. I told him I had hung up my marching shoes. And the last words he said to me before he walked away, he said, he said Smith, don't ever hang up your marching shoes. Mm. Always going to need them. Don't ever hang them up. So, uh, and I, I, re I repeated that many times. Every, I, that stuck with me forever. And I want to I want to say that to the young people here. you got to keep on marching. The final thing, you have got to just find a way to control that. I mean, we all had to find a way to control it. There were always people out there who said that, uh, the irony of it, they were never part of the, the real march. You know, they, they were always on the side. Like Dr. King said, they were behind the bushes throwing rocks or they were over on the side because they didn't want to get caught and they didn't want to get shot at by the police because they didn't, because they were scared of being hurt. And, uh, and what they were, what Dr. King was worried about was it was going to get him hurt and other nonviolent people in the movement hurt. And, uh, and that's the real problem. But let me just say, that uh, nonviolence has is a very powerful thing. I, I, I know it's hard for young people who think, well, if somebody hit you, you're supposed to hit them back. Well, your natural instinct is to do that. We're all programmed that way. I'm programmed that way. Somebody, if I if I hear something that sounds like a gunshot, I'm gonna duck like everybody else. I'm not trying to stand up there. I'm not trying to be the last one standing so I can get take a bullet that wasn't meant for me. Uh, so I'm gonna duck like everybody else. And I'm, but the fact of the matter is. Everybody can participate in a nonviolent demonstration. And especially when you start to add other things to it, you start boycotting the downtown stores. You say, okay, until you solve this problem of police brutality, until you solve this problem of, of, of the police choke holding people, until you change some of these laws, we're just not gonna participate in this economy anymore. And then you have to organize people not to go down there. I remember my, my, one of the best organizing jobs I did in, in my whole career, I did in Atlanta before I even went to Mississippi. We organized the for the Christmas holiday, we, we broke out of downtown Atlanta. Uh, we, we, we pretty much shut downtown down. But a picket line, we had all these college students. Hey, we, we told people not to go home for Christmas. Stay in the camp, stay at school, stay in the area. And so we could picket. We have a lot of people downtown every day. And so we, we brought the whole, we, we, we tried to shut the whole place down, uh, which actually we got so, 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 so bodacious with that. Dr. King, thought, he told us we were, he, he thought we weren't being cooperative enough. Uh, but, um, the fact of the matter is that we were able to organize, and you can do that with a nonviolent movement because you've got the moral, you've got the, what Dr. King would call the moral, you're on the moral high ground, let's put it that way. 
and you can get everybody involved in it. You can be in a wheelchair and help with a boycott. All you need to do is pick up the phone and call somebody. Or you can just say, well, I'm going to participate by not going down there. Because if I don't go down there, my neighbors don't go, my girlfriends don't go down there, won't be anybody shopping. Mm -hmm. And so eventually you'll be able to shut that joint down. And that's what you really want to do, bring enough power, enough leverage together so you can make the powers that be change. But then if they don't change, uh, you can eventually vote some of them out of office. That's why you, that's why you do your voter registration at the same time. <laughs> so, because those people are gonna have to come up for re-election. And when they come up for re-election, uh, you just show them that you know you mean business. That if they don't do what you want them to do, you don't get them out of there. Find somebody who will. Well, before we get to voter <clears throat> voter suppression and, and voting rights, kind of building on Donia's question, it just seems to me that your generation of civil rights movement leaders and activists have this body of knowledge about how county, state, and federal legislatures are going to react to kind of what you represent and what and what we're all fighting for. And I'm just curious if that that rich body of knowledge to say is being passed to younger groups like Black Lives Matter to kind of say, well, almost like mentors to say, look, if you do this, if you organize in this way, this is how county, state, and federal legislatures are going to push back on you. So you need to have plans to address it by doing X, Y, and Z. Well, you know, there, uh, there, there is a, uh, let me answer that in two ways. One, I'm a member of something called the SNCC Legacy Project which we organized for this purpose that you're talking about. We have a website, we have a, uh, we have a, we have, we do online uh, seminar, everything's online now. We do workshops, we do various other things. So we try to make ourselves available for people. Uh, but, but uh, so that's one thing. But the other thing is this, you gotta remember something else. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, we, when we first went to Raleigh, North Carolina to organize in 1961, we were gonna be a part of Dr. King's organization. We was going to be there. The, 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 the young student group affiliated with Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We spent a half a day with him, listening to him talk and his aides and all these people. And we decided, you know what? We raised our hands and said, can we be excused for a minute so we can go talk? We left the room and never came back. We said, we got to start our own organization because if we, if we join up with them, we'll never get a word in edgewise and, we, and they'll be telling us what to do. So there's a double-edged sword there, brother. These young people, you don't want to, you don't, you want them, their energy is important. And they and they and they have many more tools than we did when I was coming up. They have access to libraries all over the world. They got a handheld device in their hand right here, like, like this right here. They can they can talk to people all over the world. They can look up stuff on the while they're talking to me. My granddaughter's searching while she's talking to me on the phone. She taught me how to do it now. And uh, so and she's only 16 years old. So 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 we we they they and, and that creative uh, ingenuity has enabled them to, to connect with other people on their own groups. And I, and I think they ought to be applauded for what they're doing. Uh, the main thing they have to do is, and, and I think this was a tough decision for all of us, is that they have to make sure that what they're doing is something that makes sense, and that, is, that, is, that is gonna benefit uh, the great majority of people, African-American and other people too, uh, Hispanics, whites, gays, and others, because we're all in this thing together, to be honest with you. Uh, because the same people who oppress black people, you know, uh, 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 you know, they, they, uh, uh, the same people who oppress black people, they oppress other people too. You know, when I when I was coming up in Georgia, same people didn't like black people, didn't like gays, they didn't like Jews, they didn't like Catholics, they didn't like anybody, but they didn't even like themselves. And so they 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 they, they, they got us first because we were so obvious targets because you could see us from across the street. But when they got through with us, they went on did everybody else too and. And you saw that, but you see that with this Trump organization that they put together with this, uh, uh, they don't really like anybody. They, 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 they think white men are supposed to run the world. They, they're supposed to have all the money. They're supposed to have all the power. They're supposed to have the military. And the rest of us are supposed to just salute when they tell us to salute. And if we don't, something bad will happen to us. Now, I don't want to live in a world like that. And you don't want to live in a world like that. African-Americans don't want to live in a world like that. And so I think we have got to, to keep this up and make sure that our young people are armed and 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 and, 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 and enthusiastic and, and I, I'm really proud. I think there's a this country has seen this past couple of years we have seen a major uprising here of African Americans of all ages and all and from all different sections of the country. And then the second point I would like to make is this: eventually, some of these young people who are out here now who are, who are, who are raising these issues and, and raising the consciousness are going to end up in public office, as I did. 
you know, as I here in City Council, Washington, D.C. for almost 16 years. And, and Marion Barry, who became the mayor of this town, was the first chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. You're seeing these young people run for office now. Uh, Stacey Abrams, who put together that great organization in Georgia, I understand she's going to run for governor. Hope she does in 2022. Uh, she does. I'll be down there working for her. I got a bunch of relatives down there in Georgia, and they'll vote at least once for her. I know that for sure. So, so, uh, so we, we're looking forward to that. So there. So, so, but I think the young people are doing very well on their own. Uh, you know, they 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 come to us when they need something. I've got uh, nine. I've got uh, three children and nine grandchildren out here now, and I try to prepare them for the good fight. And uh, you know, every once in a while, I take them to the march. They don't want. They may not. Sometimes they don't want to go. I said, well, let's go anyway. Granddaddy got one more march left in them. Let's go do it right now. And so, yeah, we we I've done that a few times, and I urge I urge parents and grandparents to do that. Just make sure they stay active, they stay involved, and they have something positive on their mind that they can do that's worthwhile. Well, it's funny that you should mention Stacey Abrams, because I was going to ask, given what you faced in the night and others faced in the 1960s um, uh, against voter suppression, how do you feel that Stacey Abrams and so many people like her over this last election cycle, even though the voter suppression that was used was different in form, was pretty much the same thing that you, that, you, know, that you guys faced in the 1960s? I mean, all these decades later, how does that make you feel? Well, you know, I've listen. I, 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 I'm like many people that you would have interviewed back in the 1960s. We would, you would have heard us say, "We're doing this so our children, our grandchildren don't have to do it. We're marching so they don't have to march. We're going to jail so they don't have to go." When these churches and things got bombed and you know people were killed, we thought, "Okay, you know, if we take it now, they'll be able to live in peace." So, so, so we thought this thing was much, much further along than we did. And I have to say, I, I've been gravely disappointed at the kind of violence that I've seen here. And, I, and, and so when I, when I look at what happened at the Capitol, though, I have to be honest with you, I have two thoughts about that. In one way, I, you know, in one way, I, 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 it frightened me. Matter of fact, my folks in Georgia called me up. One of my sisters was crying. She said, it's time for you to get out of my They have taken over the Capitol. <laughs> she thought they were going to invade the neighborhood where I live and you live and everybody else. I said, don't worry, we got this thing under control. They'll be going out, they'll be going tomorrow. <laughs> but, uh, but, it, but it was frightening to see. But on the other hand, this violent thing has always been in America. When, when, you, hear these, when you see CNN and other, these other stations talk about how many arms are being purchased every day by civilians, these are, these, these are the military grade rifles that you can buy. You can buy them, you can buy them right here in Maryland, Virginia. They, they, they are they have Walmart sell, was selling them, and, and uh, all these people say, you're walking in, along for some one time, you didn't even need any ID, you just go up there with some money, they will sell it to you, and you yeah. can buy all the ammunition you want. These people have formed gun, gun clubs, and they've got all kind of organizations, they call themselves patriots and all kind of names. So, and they're, they're positioning themselves for violent insurrection, and, and mostly, and they're mostly hostile towards black people. So, so when you get into these southern states where my family lives in Georgia, my son, one of my sons is in Tennessee, and one in Mississippi, uh, they know that these people are violent. And they, and, and so now in many cases, now don't get don't, don't get it twisted. In many cases, African Americans have armed themselves too. Yep, they have. Yes, they have. They have. They they're all packing, and many of them, you know, have been in the military themselves. They got their own little organizations. They all go to gun ranges and practice periodically. So so, so, but, but we knew that there was a lot of violence out here, a lot of weapons that are aimed toward uh, the uh, hostility toward African Americans. We knew that we live with it all the time. Now the nation has seen that happen here in the Capitol. I can tell you right now, if those people had got their hands on Nancy Pelosi, on Vice President Pence, they would have done something horrible for them. Yeah, they, they would have. You would have seen something horrible happen in the nation's Capitol, right here in the city. You would have seen, at least they would have held them hostage. So you would have had a hostage situation up there for a long time. So, so, so that that stuff that we've lived with for all these years has been undercover. Now it's out in the public. We've got to find a way to do something about that. And hopefully Biden and President Biden and, and, and Vice President Kamala Harris and the Justice Department, uh, those people who are in charge of the government will find a way to try to do something about this because it's gotten out of hand now. And uh, thank God we defeated it with the Trump people, but he's going to speak today talk about what he's going to try to do in 2020 and 2024. So so he's not going yet. We're going to have to beat them again at the polls. So the young people that are working hard out here tonight, y'all got to stay vigilant. 
I was there on the battlefield because some we have to do it all over again in order yeah. to make the place safe for all of us. So, so one of the things that um that has, that really frustrates me, and Donnie and I were talking about this before the show, is especially on social media when violence like that happens, the first thing that some parts of American society says is, "Oh, this is an American." And Donnie and I, we just laugh on the phone and we go, yes, it is. It's, it always, is. it's always been like this. It is. And, and the thing is, is that, you know, I actually was talking to someone on Twitter and I was, when Brian and I was having the conversation and I'm like, this is, she was like, oh, I don't understand why this is happening and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, it, you, it's, it's starting to happen to you. Black people have been telling y'all this for years that these things are going on and you just chose not to listen. You felt like we were, oh, you're just exaggerating and so on and so forth, blah, blah, blah. All of the regular rhetoric that, you know, stuff that you put out there. When in actuality, we've been telling you this for years and this stuff is going to continue to, it's going to happen. It's going to continue to happen. It has happened and you're going to, it's going to continue to happen until we own up to the history that was America as a whole. Right. So I guess my my question is for you, learning that you were disappointed, learning that, you know, this is, do you feel like in any way that we're actually going backwards? And, well, you know, well, yeah. Well, you know, a good Baptist preacher once said that you can take people down in the valley all you want to, but if you don't take them up to the mountaintop before they leave, they won't come back. So so, mm. so here's how we take them to the mountaintop when they come to the African-American Civil War Museum. We take them through, uh, we start a little bit about slavery and then we go through the Civil War with our soldiers. And at the end of it, there's a chart that I put together. I did it actually for my grandchildren, but it served the purpose for everybody else too. And that is that, because that, they, I'm sure they must ask themselves, well, my granddad went through all this, these people marched, what, what good is, what's happening with that? Is anything happening that's any good out of all of this? And I'm give, I'm give you two, a couple of examples. When I started college in 1959, 1960, there was roughly 250,000 black kids who were going to college in the United States, 250,000. Now, most of us were going to historically black schools, 99% of us, including myself. I was at Morehouse College in Atlanta because the schools were segregated. And most of those historically black schools, by the way, were in the South. Yep. The only one that was in the North, Howard was here in Washington, D.C. There was one in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, one in Pennsylvania. Most of those schools were in the South. <laughs> 2008, the year that President Obama ran, there was 2.5, 2.2 million black people enrolled in college. Most of them were enrolled in what we call historically white college. They were going to school to places where they couldn't have even gone to school when, I, when we started the civil rights movement. And if you look at income for the black community, it went up from like, uh, uh, Eight, eight or nine billion dollars in 19, uh, 1950 when I did start the chart to almost 900 billion dollars in, in 2008, the year President Obama runs. We, we, are, we, are, we are working, going to college more. And, and, and those jobs, by the way, that, that are, we are earning all this money is in these big cities. When you hear people in Washington, D.C. say, Marion Barry gave me my first job. Marion Barry gave me my, helped me buy my first house. If you look at the history of Washington, D.C., you will see that the black middle class grows big time in Washington, D.C. when African-Americans take over this government, people who've been in the, in the civil rights movement, Barry, myself, and others. And we make it possible through homestead programs to buy houses. We make it possible through youth, youth, marriage, youth leadership program for people to get into the government. And that's happening all over the country. It's happening in Detroit at the same time. It's happening in New Orleans at the same time. It's happening in, in Atlanta. Actually, Atlanta's doing a bit, bigger job of it than we're doing here in D.C., quite honestly. And so, 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 yeah, something good is happening in the black community. We have more kids going to school. They're earning more money. Uh, we have a larger black middle class here in the United States. We're making a lot of progress here. And it doesn't mean that you're still not getting police action that's killing a lot of black people. And, 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 and these educated young black people keep being killed just like everybody else, too, by the way. Any black man who's caught out after dark, I've got a 21-year-old grandson, handsome, smart kid who lives out in Maryland. You know, we'd be worried about it every time he's out late at night. Because, you know, you know what could happen to him. You know you know what could happen to him, you know. And so, so yeah, we, 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 we made some progress. We still live with this awful scare of violence and stuff like that. But, but we have to keep working hard to make the country a better place. We have to keep believing in ourselves. 
And I, I talked to you about that exhibit that we're doing about First Lady Barack Obama, Michelle Obama and her family, because they start out as slaves in the United States. They live through all the violence in the South. They leave the South and go to Detroit. I mean, I'm sorry, to Chicago, because they're trying to get away from all this violence. They get there in 1919, there's a race riot, a race riot where black people are being hunted down in Chicago. They, they, they left South Carolina to get away from there, now they're in Chicago. <laughs> and so they had to survive that too. She had a, a grandmother there. Uh, who Phoebe, who was my favorite character. She had a pot of lye on the kitchen stove. She said, they come in here and get me, they're going to get some of this lye. I, I'm sure she brought that lye with her. Hey, she brought that lye with her from South Carolina. That's some good old South Carolina lye right there. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you get some of that on you. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd you be looking for some help. <laughs> it was there yeah. a long time, too. So, yes. So we're going to have Sister Phoebe's uh, stove that she was cooking on and a pot there, you know, that she was stirring in to let people know that, uh, that you know, hey, you got, to, you got to do what you got to do when the time comes. But but the fact of the matter is we've had to face all of this. We've still made progress. We were able to get an African-American elected president of the United States. And let me just say up something about that for a second. I've been in D.C. now since 1968. I've seen a lot of presidents. Some of them are better than others. I was here when Jimmy Carter was here. I was here when and of course, Bill Clinton had that, uh, that affair with that young lady. Uh, the, I was here when, when Tricky Dick Nixon broke into that place and stole all that stuff. And, you know, he had a vice president named Spiro Agnew who was taking money in the White House in a paper bag. And the Lord knows that we just, this one that just left town, he was probably the worst that we've ever seen. But the Obama family in eight years never had a scandal, never had any kind of corruption, Never had, they were they were an intact African American family, father and children, mother, grandmother, living together in the White House. They did a great job for our country. They did a great for, job for, for us too. They let us. They re, they they reminded us one more time that we can do anything anybody else can do. America is the most complicated, richest government in the world. We have the biggest army and air force in the world. Obama could operate that like any other president. Showed he could do it. And so for those people who don't think we can do, yes, we can. And I think one of the reasons why these, some of these people are so angry about against black people is some of it is jealousy and envy. Some of it is jealousy and envy, you all. Jealousy and envy are powerful stuff. Yes, it I is. How we, I don't know how we get away from this, but some of this reaction, this reaction to Obama by, by the CPAC that's meeting today and by those uh, Tea Party people is just plain old jealousy and envy. They, 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 I don't know why they feel that way. They kept us enslaved all those years. They kept us riding the back of these buses, drinking colored water, and we couldn't get a decent job. We had to get two jobs, make one good job out of it. We had to, you know, we had to do all kinds of stuff. Phoebe had to cook loud and stove to protect our family from a white mob, you know. So I don't know why they have such a, uh, uh, such a horrible reaction to African Americans, but, uh, some of it, I think, is because they think we have outdone them in some cases, which is not our fault, it's their fault. Well, we have. I mean, I mean and I don't mean to, I, I, I don't want to make this into something, you know, crazy or whatever the case may be. But let's look at, let's look at what, what it is you're talking about. And this is one of the things, and this actually leads to a question that I have for you. The Reconstruction era was not taught in school. They did not, and they, they left that out. And it wasn't until, it didn't go into detail. Let me rephrase that. They didn't go into to great detail on the Reconstruction period. Now, you were you grew up during a time period where you had people that was telling you about your history. But as I grew up, I'm not going to say my mom or my dad didn't tell me about our history, but the stuff that I know now didn't come from them. It came from my research. And if I look, and it was because of that research, when I looked at the reconstruction era and I saw what we as African Americans were doing at that time period, it literally scared the bejeebus out of them. Because if you look at that short 12 to 15 year time period, you had 1500 representatives in all late local state and federal governments that were black now all of a sudden right out of slavery. You had doctors, you had lawyers, you had teachers. This scared them. We actually went on a 
on a fast track and instead of hitting the ground running, we hit the ground driving at high top speed. And we not only did we catch up with them, but in some instances surpassed them. And this wasn't the first time that it happened because I believe Brian was talking to me about somebody else um, in the 1700s. He was a he was a uh, I can't remember who he was. Oh, it's um, I think it wasn't Anthony Johnson. It was a man. Well, I can't remember his name, but he was one of the first 20 and odd Africans that were brought over to Virginia. And it was because of him, right, that they, once he made his his mark right. after he died, they were like, okay, this person can't be, like, Black people can't do what he's done anymore. Well, what, it, what it was, was he became a magistrate. It was him and someone else. I right. can't remember who. Right. But two of them were magistrates in Virginia. And when they died, the Virginia House of Burgesses made the law that no other Black person could ever be a magistrate. Right. right. They were literally so, closing the door behind them. Right. So my question to you is because you had the history that you have and now our children don't have that kind of history. What do you think are the best steps to move forward to help get this history to our t our children so that they understand that the power within them? And I'm not just talking about just black children. I'm talking about white children, Hispanic children, all of them, because it teaches this history will teach them how to respect our culture, understand that we are not beneath anybody. Right. And, you know, just how do you feel that we can re reintroduce uh, this know, history? Uh, well, let, let, me, let me say something. First of all, I run a museum. So obviously I think this is one of the ways to teach. Certainly, and I, and I feel like I've been gifted more than anybody. I've got the best job in the world. I, I survived the civil rights, but the Lord let me survive all that craziness in Mississippi for six years and jails and mobs and all kinds of things. And then I come to D.C., I get elected to council and I get to serve in office here, make some changes in the city. And then I get to build a museum, which I saw in my older year, I'm 78 years old now, so my retirement years, I get to set up an exhibit uh, here that I, and, 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 and in D.C., we're trying to make this, we're doing two things here. One is that we want to get every child in the D.C. public school system into our system, one way or another. Either We can't do it now, obviously, because of COVID. So now we're doing it all like everybody else. We're doing it by Zoom and various other things and our website and things like that. Uh, but but we, but we but the in the curriculum for the D.C. public schools now, uh, there is a position, there's a, there, they, they talk about the, uh, about, uh, about, uh, D.C. history. They talk about the history of, 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 of slavery in D.C. and then Reconstruction and and, and, the, and, and the, the Emancipation Proclamation. So we're, so we're working on that. I have a group of people that we sent out to the to the schools to work with teachers and bring kids in, and we have something called a passport to freedom. It looks like a real passport, but you know most of our kids have never had a passport because they never had a reason to have one. They never been out of the country and they don't have any reason to have one. So we, we, we concocted this idea of a passport. It was just like one you would get if you went to get to, to the State Department. And, uh, and we, 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 you come to our museum, we give you a passport, we stamp it when you, get, when you leave there, and you get 10 more stamps at any museum you want to go to, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world. You get 10 stamps, send it back to us, and we send you a prize. Because we not only want you to go to our museum, we want you to go to other museums also. So, so we work hard at trying to get our young people here now, one of the reasons why I have to do this now, let me let me let me just run. The, you probably know this already, but sometimes you have to speak the obvious. Our museum is just like all other museums in DC. Probably seventy percent of our audience is white. That's right. We get a lot of tourists from all over the world. Uh, as a matter of fact, Michelle Obama herself would send tourists to our, us from the White House. People get. We've had two or three groups from from uh, England that uh, that uh, were referred to us from from the White House, and so so we we got to, we get people from all over the world. So we're sitting here with people coming from all around, and D.C. kids are not coming. So that's not good enough for me. So I put together this Passport to Freedom program to try to get these people to come. And I'll tell you a funny story about this. Uh, uh, this, this ought to make you laugh. So one day, so, so we, I have a guy who was working for me who was working at the Cardinals in High School, and he's part of our Passport to Freedom program. And he has a group called the Talented Tent. Now, this is the opposite of what Du Bois had in mind. These are... These are, these are not the kids who are the brains in the class, the top 10%. These are the ones that are one step from being expelled because they were knuckleheads and whatever, whatever. So he's trying to work the bottom to try to make sure they stayed in school and all kinds. And so they had a, they, they would take field trips with us when we went to Gettysburg and other places and we'd give them a little 
scholarships and jobs and things like that. So one day I had about 10 of those kids at the museum and a busload of white kids pulled up from somewhere out in the Midwest and they got off the bus and you know, when everybody come in there one time, it looks like a crowd of people. So one of these young little black kids from Cardozo looked at me and he said, Mr. Smith, he said, what are all these white people doing here? I thought it was our museum. We can't have nothing. Soon we get something up in the neighborhood. <laughs> so I said, I said, well, son, it's all right. They need this history as much as you do. They don't know right. about it. They, they learning too. They're just like you. I said, they need to know our history so they have a better appreciation for who we are and what we've done. That's right. To make this country what it is. And so, but I thought it was funny though that this young kid was he was saying to himself, you know what? Yeah, we, we build something up here. Here they come. We, we, yeah, I mean it, it's funny. <laughs> you you're absolutely right. And I, I'm 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 just glad that I'm on the same wavelength as you. <laughs> yeah, but to give you a good idea of um what Donnie was talking about, about kind of our advancement during the reconstruction period. And th this is where genealogy and family history really is a wonderful thing, especially for, for people of color, is we have an ancestral cousin from Edgefield, South Carolina. His name is John. He was born towards the end of slavery. Within five years, mm. he had taught, and he was illiterate. And within five years, he had taught himself to read, write, and had put himself through Wilberforce University. Wow. That's a great story. It is a great story. Yeah, and we he did a lot more other stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. That's a great story. Well, I'm you know, going to send you my book because that's what I would like to do because I did write a book and his story is in my book and I'm definitely going to send it to you it's, just it's, so you we, can we read have it. A, we, have a, we, we sell a lot of books. I, I, we sell a lot of books. We'll have your old book signing one day. We'll we got to wait till we get out, get everybody to get our shots and get out under COVID so we can do things again. Uh, then, then we'll come on. We'll 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 have, we'll have you over to talk about your about, about your book. But let, let me oh. say one, let me say one last thing though about Reconstruction, because I, I I think we have to rewrite Reconstruction. I, 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 it, it, there are a lot of black people who got Reconstruction wrong. Historians. It wasn't just the whites. You know, okay. if you think about this, African Americans, we we don't we 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 get our freedom in 1865 at the end of the Civil War. 1865. By the time we get to 1890. There's a hundred black colleges in the United States. Mm -hmm. Before the Civil War, it's against a lot of teach black people how to read and write. Mm -hmm. Now we've gone off. We got a hundred black colleges. Almost all those colleges are in the South. Almost all of them are located in the South. Now let's back up for a minute. How do you get to college? You got to get out of high school first. The the, the Rosenwald Foundation alone during Reconstruction built five thousand schoolhouses in the South. Now I had one of those schoolhouses where I went to school. I went to the St. John Baptist Church School for the first four years. It's called the St. John Baptist Church because it sat on the St. John Baptist Church school ground. Church owned the building. They built the building. They took that that uh, that that uh, architectural plans that that Rosenwald put together and bought the from bought from Sears and Roebuck the wood, and the, and the members of the church went out and voluntarily built this little two room schoolhouse. That's where I went to school for the first four years. Now I walked to school, and my I, my white kids rode to school. They passed me on a school bus. And I, I just went to Georgia a few weeks ago and buried my sister, Gussie, who was 18 months older than I was. But Gussie and I started the school at the same time. We had to walk along this country road that didn't have any sidewalk, y'all. We had to walk in the road. Uh -huh. So when the cars came, we had to get over in the ditch so we wouldn't get run over. So at her funeral, I said, well, you know, my sister kept me alive all these years because I probably would have been dead in the ditch if she hadn't been over there. <laughs> we'll be back when I got out of the way. And, uh, but, I, but that's, you know, we, we, we did all of that, but we were educating our people. Yeah. We, because we knew, our parents knew, our grandparents knew that in order for us to get ahead, we had to do, we had to be smarter than they were. We had to work harder than they did. We had yeah. to do more to make it all, to get the little bit that we had because they weren't going to give us any kind of opportunity to take right. in, in, in this country. And so, I think that's, I think that we got to rewrite reconstruction. We saw that was a period of time where African Americans bloomed, blossomed. I mean, we yes, had, it did. And they, it's, it's not even about rewriting it. It's more or less just freaking teaching it. Yeah. Let's teach it. They, they don't, you know, they, they don't teach it. But I want to thank you because we have definitely gone through this hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I've enjoyed it. And, and I did too. I enjoyed yeah. everything you said. And I, I'm so, so excited. So you have to send me your address so that I can send you my book. And Brian has also written a book. And um, I don't know, you know, we, we just want to make sure you have it so you know 
All right. Well, you got my you got my phone number. So you can yes. Give me that number. Okay. And then I'll I'll send. But but my address, the museum address, is nineteen twenty five. Vermont Avenue, Northwest, Washington, D.C. We're right at, at Vermont Avenue and New Street, Northwest, uh, at the subway stop. The subway is named the African American Civil War Memorial Stop. It sure green, is. On the Green Line. That's where we are. And we will put a link to the museum. And we'll put a link to the museum in the comments section. Okay. But thank you so much. I mean, again, as Donnie said, th this hour is just zipped by. There were so many more questions that we, bo we both had for you, but um, those will have to wait to another day. All right. Well, thank yeah. you so very much. And you can all, you can get me anytime. I'm happy to talk to you whenever you get a chance. Okay. Well, next week. Okay, guys. So we're, we're going to transition from, um, quote unquote, Black History Month to Women's History Month and starting in March. We have such a show for you guys. Come March 7th, we will be talking about Majeska Simpkins. We talked about her niece in um, the early part of February. But then um, after her particular show, we have something so great for you guys that it actually takes up the rest of Women's History Month. It's a three-part series that uh, uh, talking about the six triple eight Postal Battalion Command. And we're this is something that you guys know nothing about. I know y'all don't know about this because it was just in the it was just in the cut and we found it. So we're so excited to talk about these these wonderful women who did thing who who are needed right now for the post office because they moved millions of letters for World War II. The only female um, battalion to go over to, where was it, Paris, France? They went to several places, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and now they're up for a Congressional Medal of Honor. So please, definitely, without a doubt, follow us next week. Come start, make sure you just mark every show as a must attend so you can get those reminders for it. But um, we want to thank you guys for joining us. I'm Donya Williams. I'm Brian Sneffy. And we we love you guys. We'll see you next week. See you next week.